So the Black Solidarity Think Tank has been working collaboratively on the development of our identity as a college, along with the practices for making sure that all stakeholders that are invested in our Seattle Pathways initiatives are doing their work anti-race, all their work is rooted in anti-racist work. However, one thing that continued to gnaw at me, and I think Sharon as well, and some of us that have been here for quite a long time, was the fact that the work that we're now fully embracing as a district and as a college is the work that black and brown faculty and staff and administrators have done since the inception, since Seattle Center became the activist school that it is today. However, not only were these faculty members and staff members and administrators doing the work, they were also con often condemned by their white colleagues for doing this work back in the day, right? But now we're at this moment where we have this full embracing of all of this uh, diversity, equity, anti-racist work. And it just was really getting at me that we have not done our due diligence in honoring those, those legends, those icons, and honoring those living legends that are here, still here today and still doing the work, okay? So that's why we have Carl and Tracy here. Carl and Tracy, Professor Carl Livingston and Professor Tracy Lai, they are two of our living legends. But I wanna just give you some background on both of them before we get started so you can fully understand why for me, these icons, their greatness is so significant, right? So this is the part that I said I didn't want to do because I get too teary. So I may have to stop. But turn, I'm going to turn my camera off. Yeah, that's better. I'll just turn my camera off because, you know, I'm hard. Yeah, I can't see tears in my eyes. Nope. I'm not giving you that. Can't give you that, Seattle Central. That part of me. So Professor Carl Livingston Esquire. He's a lead professor of political science here at Seattle Central. And he has also served as the chief executive officer, which we now call, um, what do we call that? Uh, the the um, president of the faculty senate here at Seattle Center. So back in the day, it was called the chief executive officer, but now it's the faculty senate president. Additionally, uh, uh, Professor Livingston is a graduate of Notre Dame. He has been working on the front line to improve the lives of black and brown students and their black and brown community since I've been here in Seattle, and that's been a long time. And he is considered a pillar of the community. He has served in many advisory and leadership roles, both locally and, and on a state level. And we do not, and I do not have enough time to highlight all of his amazing work. However, I do want to bring just some things to your attention that for me, as I was doing my dissertation, dissertation research, I needed to make sure that I documented. So first, he was the chair of a panel appointed by the Seattle City Council that reported on the inadequate preparations of the 1999 WTO conference here in Seattle, which for those of you that were here in 1999, and those of us that were working here, which are many of us, we know what happened during that time. And it was an absolute, it was like the insurrection that you saw on January the 6th. Let's just put it that way. Um, call has authored and published scholarly articles for Howard Law Journal, such as the Affirmative Action on Trial, the Retraction of Affirmative Action and the Case for its Retention. Additionally, he has authored Shoe Strings and Bootstraps. I remember when Carl wrote that book, The Little Green and Black Book, A Development Plan for Black America. Professor Livingston continually honors the oral traditions of our ancestors through his storytelling. And because of the his storytelling, he's often called upon by local, regional, and national organizations to deliver keynote addresses. And currently, Carl, Professor Livingston is shopping for publication of another scholar, scholarly article titled, Pulling the Curtain Back on the 50-Year Governmental Scheme Holding African Americans and People of Darker Color Back, entitled, Outing the Southern Strategy. Thank you, Carl. And next, we have my collaborator, one of my mentors, and most of all, my dear friend, Tracy. Tracy has earned her tenure at Seattle Central in 1995, and hopefully she'll get to touch on some of what that traumatic experience was like for her. Um, she teaches history, ethnic, women's studies, 
And she's also taught women's studies at the University of Washington, along with diversity, power, and privilege courses at Antioch University. Tracy has taught more than 15 learning communities here at Seattle Central, from Speaking for Ourselves to Holocaust Memory and Meaning. And she is the co-author of The Snake Dance of Asian American Activism, Community, Vision, and Power, an analysis of the Asian American movement. Several of Tracy's collaborative articles on Asian American workers appear in AAPU Nexus, which is a UCLA journal, and she is currently co-writing a book, Asian American Workers Rising in Celebration of Apollo's 30th Anniversary. As a scholar activist, Tracy serves as Vice President for Human Rights, American Federation of Teachers. She's the National Secretary of the Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance, APALA, and Vice President of the Seattle APALA. Tracy is a member of the National AFT Civil and Human Rights Standing Committee. And recently, Tracy was appointed to the National AFT's Asian American and Pacific Islander Task Force in response to the increase, increased violence against Asians during the pandemic. Right now, Tracy is leading the Seattle, AFT Seattle Action Team for negotiations. Thank you, Tracy. And she continues to serve as an officer in other uh, capacities. So it's my honor to introduce two of our living legends, two of my friends, Professor Livingston and Tracy Lai. Thank you, Dr. Kimberly. Thank you. Carl, I'm gonna do the share screen. Mm -hmm. Thanks. We'll just get this going. Well, I would like to say that um, y'all are making history with Carl and I. This is the first time um, that we've been invited to have this kind of conversation with all of you. And um, in trying to put together the many things we wanted to mention, the list just got too long. <laughs> and Dr. Kimberly had to remind us um, you're the lead up to this brilliant keynote speaker <laughs> and the history is so important and the keynote is going to get the rest of it going. So, so please think of this as a beginning conversation with um, reflection on both of our parts. Uh, I have a few slides that include some images to help take us back into some historical moments. But overall, as uh, Dr. Kimberly and Carl and I were planning, we realized that what we wanted to bring home particularly was the before and after of I-200, which if that's not quite ringing a bell, Carl is gonna explain that a little bit later. But uh, I get, because I'm the historian, I get to talk a little bit about, let's see, I gotta clear this up so you can see more of it. Yeah. I get to do a, a little bit of that history. So I want to start before Seattle Central was built and founded. And um, the reason I want to start with that before is because part of the racial legacy is understanding that Broadway High School had its moment of expulsion in the time of Executive Order 9066, which was signed in 1942. The image that you're looking at is, um, it's been a long time since we've been able to see and hear that fountain, but it is the fountain that was given to Seattle Central by George Sudakawa, who himself was one of those approximately 216 Japanese American students who were forced out as part of that roundup. There's another part of that struggle because we are talking about the activism which has been there from the beginning of Seattle Central. There was a lot of organizing to make sure we saved that fountain because partly because of its age, it had fallen into some disrepair. And there was a horrific moment where it was briefly contemplated that 
just maybe selling off the fountain could be its own fundraiser. And students and the community, faculty, staff, all kinds of us came together and said, no, we need to have the fountain here. This was meant to be. And so um, over a number of years, um, enough money was raised to try to ensure that there would be a maintenance fund as there ought to be for all important works of art that our college has been bequeathed with. Uh, if you look at kind of the, uh, the edge of the wall for the fountain, you can see uh, tiny um, origami suru or cranes who have been folded and um, little candles. And this is part of that remembering. Um, we will be doing a virtual remembering on um, February 18th. It will be district-wide. It will not include the fountain, but look for publicity about that. Okay. So now we get to the founding of our beloved college. Uh, I first want to just remind us that in the 1960s, it is an enormous, um, there is so much movement uh, that um, all kinds of movements that are coming together, they are partly separate, but they are also coalescing. And, um, and, and I think we need to hold on to that idea to appreciate the role that um, students played in calling upon Seattle Central to be the kind of college that it needed to be to be accountable to its surrounding communities and particularly to people of color. And so, um, you know, there's a number of dates and you can see them on the slide. The uh, kind of the largest um, and most sustained long-term like months student strikes were in California, San Francisco State and UC Berkeley, but students all around, including at what became Seattle Central, also took some very bold actions to call upon the administrative leadership to do right by the students. And so the inspiration of the Black Student Union in the years 1968-69 resulted in the creation of curriculum that could reflect and incorporate their experiences and community needs, as well as the hiring of black faculty and administrators. Inspired by the role that the black student union, the leadership that they demonstrated, the Oriental Student Union and the naming of that group is a story in itself, but I will not go into that at this moment that this stu student group, the OSU, held a sit-in of the president's office in 1971. And some of what they called for also mirrored the bold example of the Black Student Union. Um, the, the, there's all kinds of connections between these groups. And so just to name one of them, if you've not already heard of a former student um, of Seattle Central, Mike Tagawa. Um, I didn't include his name on the slide, but happy to provide that for you if you decide you want to look him up. He's one of those individuals who, whose solidarity crossed some of the boundaries that we see between ourselves. He was one of the members of the Seattle Black Panther Party, as well a student member of the Oriental Student Union and the support of the Seattle chapter of the Black Panther Party in what students at Seattle Central were, was calling for was very important. Okay, um, this is from Seattle Times archives and um, it's, um, we're not quite chronological here, but it is um, just, it's a photo of um, Black Student Union members um, engaging in um, call upon a board of trustees and guess what? The Board of Trustees is meeting this afternoon, but that's another story. Come to Power Hour to talk about that. This uh, other picture, I know it's a um, background to my big statement for the slide, Seattle Central at the epicenter of social justice protests. But the photo that you're looking at is um, from um, a protest in 1990. Um, Seattle Central has often been, not only because of students, but also because of community and social justice movements convening at this very central point 
often because people are about to march downtown, but often because it's um, pulling in that history um, of, of activism. And so uh, Dr. Kimberly Carl and I created a short list. It is not the most inclusive list, but it is to remind ourselves about the many different social justice movements that um, our students, um, our college community, indeed the greater community have, um, have, have needed to speak, speak out about. In 2001, um, some of you might remember for the longest time, there was a banner that was hanging outside the college about 2001, Seattle Central as one of Time Magazine's College of the Year. What the banner couldn't have because, you know, how much text can you put on a banner is that the recognition was directly related to this history of equity and inclusion that Seattle Central has been such a leader in. Okay, so we've seen some of these images and I hope I've gotten you thinking about either what you experienced because you too are a long time employee or what you know as a newer employee. Um, and, 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 um, and I wanted to offer some thoughts about um, some of what I as a historian see as um, conditions and, and a convergence of activism, if you will. And I always think about how so much, especially when we're thinking about the earliest moments, that it comes, this activism has come from what I'll say, the bottom up, so to speak. Maybe a better or a different term would be the grassroots. So often it is our students who are putting into practice what they are learning. Um, on the slide, I say they're critical thinking skills, but of course it's more than that. It's the, the kinds of frameworks, the kinds of analyses that they are applying. Just a few of the projects that I would like to um, mention and as well um, shout out to the student run newspapers, that's a plural, uh, which in the earliest, like the 1966 earliest uh, was a newsprint. <laughs> yeah, you could open up the pages and all of that. Um, it took different forms and always there was a lot of struggle because students in their exercise uh, of, uh, freedom of speech and as the journalists they were putting into practice butt heads with uh, our administration and, and it was difficult, extremely difficult, but important, very important because as we know, a fundamental part of democracy is our access to information. And, um, you know, I mean, without that, well, then we're facing another kind of oppression uh, there was um, a project um, which um, our dear colleague, now retired and emeritus Tina Young, uh, helped to um, initiate. Uh, and that was the Students of Color Success Stories, which um, had a beautiful set of portraits of those students, as well as oral history interviews. And for some time, it was on display in a number of places around the college. Uh, and I think um, that became a natural bridge to what, be, what uh, the Washington Center um, at Evergreen State helped to uh, facilitate a, a big collaboration among a number of institutions, including Seattle Central, which resulted in the critical moments case stories. The reason I say it's kind of a bridge from the students of color success stories is that in interviewing those students, we realized that those critical moments that they faced, so that turning point, am I gonna be able to continue my education or, or is, you know, is that it? That those kinds of critical moments could also be stories that were teachable and usable. And so a whole body of case stories evolved from that. Okay, I'm just gonna have to move this much more quickly. So uh, I know you've already breezed through the other points, but, um, Certainly when affirmative action was something that was um, in place and valued, um, we, you know, um, we, we, we looked different because of the kinds of hiring. Um, 
And it was only when Dr. Kimberly and I were co-presidents that our union was able to come to a memorandum of understanding, that's the abbreviation, MOU, which um, while not perfect, was certainly a first and important step in contract language for an organization to become anti-racist, which as you remember is the title of what we're looking at all of this morning. So related to that, um, not, not the MOU, but more um, along uh, faculty work that has reflected um, becoming anti-racist, I wanted to remind all of us that there have been um, and actually I shouldn't just say faculty of color affinity groups because they weren't just faculty. It was um, staff, staff of color affinity groups. Mm -hmm. And then most recently, I hope that you are aware of the BIPOC anti-racist caucus, which emerged in, in the response to the um, Black Lives Matter and racial justice protests um, for um, a, approximately a year ago. Learning communities have often been a space where we could, as a collaborative team and as a whole community with students, explore these ideas and institutionally shout out to Academy of Rising Educators. Okay, really need to transition fast. The last idea that I wanted to put forward is that convergence of activism involves collaboration. It involves resources to support those efforts. It involves a whole kind of culture of the college and certainly women of color in all of these different um, areas, um, structures of our college have played those roles. Um, in some ways, the list is too long to put on one slide. And in some ways, the list is not long enough. So I wanna transition so that Carl can take us away and, and Dr. Kimberly will be adding remarks as well. Um, so here's an image of of a rally, one of many, that took place on our campus, student organized and led, but also participation by faculty. In fact, I'm remembering, I'm remembering Carl in the front of a march, bullhorn in hand, rallying all of us. Um, and, um, but the reason I want you to hold on to this image is, um, again, the importance of that particular initiative uh, I-200 and what it would mean um, when it got passed. And, and Dr. Kimberly will be wrapping all of this up because her research and dissertation looked very closely at particular effects that we all need to pay attention to. So um, Carl, I don't know if you want me to keep this particular Sorry. slide up or if you'd just like to have, have it all back. Uh, this, I'll start with this one, and okay. I just want to thank you for such a very good historical uh, um, uh, background and and framing, because this is so difficult to do in such a short amount of time. Um, but uh, hopefully, you you are you are being reminded of some of the things most of you all know. Some may be just learning now, but most of you know, which is that our uh, college has. Uh, been a seedbed of uh, progressive um, uh, ideas, and we have been uh, leaders in progressive movements in the greater uh, Seattle area. And um, it was uh, very much shaped by the fourth floor and supported by the uh, the uh, president and administration. So uh, from the Dean on down of humanities and social sciences, uh, the faculty and some of the staff, uh, you know, uh, wanted to participate in uh, uh, teach-ins that we would do, rallies that we were involved in, innovative ways of teaching and all of that stuff. And much of it connected to the community with, uh, uh, Dr. Rosetta Hunter, the Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences, helping to lead the way both in um, uh, what we were doing instructionally with the CSPs and what we were doing uh, uh, in terms of um, curriculum to make sure we didn't teach from a Eurocentric perspective, 
uh, we, t we, as much as we could, taught, um, we tried not to center on anything, but if we centered on something, we centered on diversity. We centered on diversity. And uh, we, we uh, critiqued and um, actively engaged the uh, perspective of Eurocentrism and uh, white privilege and all of that. So, um, and we did it with Evergreen's help. Uh, we worked very, very closely with Evergreen University and supported the establishment of the Tacoma branch by uh, working with Dr. Maxine Mims and Joy Hardeman and, and all of that. There was a sharing of faculty and so much of what was done was done from faculty. And listen, faculty like me who came in, they helped to shape people like me. I, I came from Oral Roberts University and then Notre Dame Law School. I was steeped in a Eurocentric frame and that's just all I knew. And they just took me along and said, come on, you're going to learn. And uh, they taught me CSPs. They taught me other ways of seeing things. Uh, they brought me to conferences at uh, Evergreen. Sometimes I'm, I was just watching Cynthia uh, 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 Chan and Manaka and maybe B. Kiyohara and others sharing about Asian perspectives and just trying to learn, uh, participating in things we were doing with Native Americans. So I felt like... I, uh, just as much a student as I was a professor, because I was coming from a long way to really open up to the ideas Central was all about. But is they would come to me and other faculty like that, and they would say, hey, we got an idea about this. See if you can help make that happen. Or other faculty would come to the deans and administrators and say, I want to do this stuff. And it was so much about, let me empower you to help you do it. And a lot of that changed, you know, it, it, we still have it, but it's more bureaucratic now. Uh, I want to thank our president, Dr. Sheila Edwards Lang, because when she came in right after the tenure was secure, she brought the school in a refreshing of this great heritage, pasted the scenes of what we have been on the hallway walls. And it was beautiful. It was, it was amazing for me because I had seen such a change. So you're reading here a lot of uh, the detail that I don't have to hit, uh, but I just want you to know we were such a beehive. I mean, just to be part of the speakers that were coming and to hear what they had to say, and they were mainly progressive. If we brought a conservative in, we framed that person, the debate was on, we let them share, but they weren't gonna take the whole time because students and faculty were going to uh, be critiquing what it is they had to say. Uh, and, and what we did uh, affected what was happening in the community and, and accentuated the progressive things happening in the community on so many fronts. You see Lori Cohen and, and her wonderful work in the Jewish American community, Nate Long and what he was doing with the film festival, Dr. Tanya Pettiford waits. And I mean, she's writing plays trying to get the Broadway Performance Hall, but really couldn't get it. She had a much smaller little theater back then. Mm -hmm. She made the most of that. Didn't have enough uh, dressing rooms and all of that. Didn't worry about it. She was putting on these innovative plays every year to undo racism and sexism. Mm -hmm. And even look at LGBTQI stuff. I mean, it was just mm -hmm. uh, amazing. So let's go to the next slide. Um, now, we at our college didn't so much um, advance critical race theory in a erudite uh, academic uh, journal sense. We did it through instruction. We did it through modeling what it what it should look like up here in this area. And we still, uh, especially the dean Rosetta Hunter, professors like Gilda Shepard. Uh, professors like um, uh, uh, many, many Collins and so many made the conferences uh, often again with uh, Evergreen Tacoma Branch faculty on the East Coast to be part of the development of ideas that made out in a practical sense what critical race theory was all about. Now, just to frame this real quick, you got your idealists and that school was pretty much gone by the wayside. The liberals, uh, the liberalism school, which is so much about uh, 
uh, capitalism and all of that's pretty much taken over with realism. Well, we would still teach those things, but we taught the structuralist ideas that looked at radically challenging how we viewed instruction. And we looked at structuralist ideas and from the critical race theory to feminist theory. And so many of the theories, feminist and womanist, so many of the theories that made sure we included as much as we could ancient China and not just Greece or the Far East and the early Americas, indigenous cultures and Africa and not just Greece. We didn't want to take Greece down. We brought the others up. For us, it was a round table. We described it as both and, not either or. And we said it proudly and with attitude back then, especially. And so that's what we were about. And, and so let's go to the next one. Then came I-200. And it wasn't just I-200, it was the movement that was involved in it. All of this stuff flowed from Reagan making real what Nixon was trying to do. And Reagan had a force behind him. For one period in my life, I was with Reagan. I voted for him in 1984. I had come through Oral Roberts University. It's just all I knew at that time. Then I went to law school, went back home, saw what these policies were doing. And I was like, I cannot push these ideas. These ideas are hurting people. I came back to the hood and saw what was happening in the community. And uh, I, I was just, I was, I was crestfallen. I was, I had tears in my eyes and I've had them ever since. And so many communities have suffered in the same way. This I-200 movement, uh, what it did, well, first of all, what was I-200? As you well know, I-200 was Tim Imons from Eastern Washington. Uh, he said he was inspired by Ward Connerly and what he was doing in California because he was on the Board of Regents there. He's a mixed race person that just considers himself mixed race. Nothing wrong with that. It's all fine. Uh, and But he's against affirmative action in the California school system and helped push and led the uh, ending of affirmative action in the school system there back in uh, the early 90s. And <clears throat> Tim Iman brought that straight up to Washington State and raised money. And next thing you know, he's pushing in a, 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 a bill, a, really an initiative, sorry, that was gonna end affirmative action mainly for everyone but white males. So it was gonna end affirmative action for race and sex but there's still affirmative action for veterans. It didn't end that. Most of those veterans, state of Washington were white. It was gonna continue affirmative action for those with disabilities. Most of those folks were white. So for the groups that fought the hardest, hardest for it and needed it the most, it was gone, and, but it was preserved and it still is in the state of Washington, mainly for the groups that are mostly white in this state. That's how deft, clever, sly, and to me, evil, I-200 was in the movement behind it. And so I did everything I could to fight it. Uh, you know, I debated it. You can read it there. And uh, But this movement was after affirmative action and diversity, but it hit diversity in such a sly way. It was after diversity, but it said, no, because we just want the, uh, we just want outcomes and we just want things objective. And we wanted we want to make sure we're teaching the, the kind of stuff that will help advance people <clears throat> in their own career choices and all that. Because you couldn't, they didn't want to come straight at diversity. It also pushed a more bureaucratic, capitalistic style of management of institutions like colleges. And so faculty became less important. Deans uh, couldn't even begin to try to get time away to be involved in academic conferences like they were before with the faculty shoulder to shoulder. They had dean's work to do. Uh, vice presidents had vice presidents work to do and it was about cutting budgets. It was about use of, of part-timers over full-timers. It was about all of this bureaucratic stuff. And next thing you know, as we went into about 2005, we're just fighting to save our jobs, fighting to just hang on. Let's go to the next screen. 
and I, I hope I haven't gone too long. I want to stop here and let uh, Kimberly take over. Just want you to know, I wrote an article, Affirmative Action on Trial, the Retraction of Affirmative Action in the Case for its Retention. And that very much put me in the mix. And I want it to be because I want it to stand against this movement and defend the stuff that I felt were taking people of color and others backwards, women. It's Kimberly. I, uh, Kimberly, you've got things to share. I hope I didn't take your time. I, I tried to make it as tight as I could. I don't know if she's... Uh... I'm here. I forgot I didn't turn my mic on. I was so, so captured in what you were saying. I was just listening to you and Tracy. So like I said, you're such great storyteller. So thank you. So I have enough time. It'll take me just a minute or two. But what I just want people to see here is... Um, this was my uh, research for my dissertation, A Pursuit of Equity, Black Faculty Stories 20 Years After the Passage of I-200. So I was one of, if not the only person in Washington State to really take a look at the impact this had on Black identified faculty in a community college system. I don't think there's any other research that I looks at Black faculty particularly. And I gathered the data from five Black faculty participants that were here before I-200 hit the books or even the discourse around I-200 and black faculty members that were, those same black faculty members were here after. So they had the, the, the whole, right? They had the whole story from beginning to end and they were, it was really significant. And what you see here were the themes that emerged from my um, research using critical race theory as an, um, a, a tool of analysis. And the tenets that really were pronounced were the permanence of racism, entrance convergence, and counter narratives. And I just want to go through that really quickly just to speak to what, what I mean by those three uh, tenets and why they really stood out in the research that I did with these, um, these living legends. And three of them are actually still here at the college and two have since retired since my, my research. So the first is uh, the first theme, uh, institutional barriers. Um, uh, the permanence of racism, as the, the, the faculty transcripts make clear that the acceptance of racist practices that they had encountered, they just accepted the racist practices that they had encountered from their colleagues. And not acceptable as long as just to go along or get along or uh, I internalize racial hate, but acceptance of the fact that racism is an Amer as American as apple pie and as was the very fabric of the institution and of American culture. Now, I know this is a very um, controversial point for many folks, but based off of these participants, that was their experience. Mm -hmm. um, the participants were not all surprised, none of them, with the behavior of the, uh, the white citizens, the predominantly white citizens of Washington State that voted and abandoned affirmative action practices. So it did not come as a surprise as often as the, is the history of black folks, as Angela Davis would say, why, we're never surprised at what white folks do to us, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so they weren't surprised. However, they were hurt, particularly because at the time, Seattle Central was still considered a progressive institution. At least we thought ide ideology, uh, their ideology was progressive. But once this conversation about I-200 hit the ground in 1997 and 1998, these faculty members started experiencing things that they never experienced with their, their, their colleagues that they never thought they would. And I was one of them because I was here at that time as well, right? So the next key theme that showed up was the commitment of, uh, uh, to diversity. And all of these black faculty members that I interviewed were hired by administrators of color. Not one of them was hired by a, um, a, a, a white administrator. And they all believed that because their black administrators were able to get, in, get, 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 get through and get hired because of affirmative action, it was be that those very reasons why they got hired uh, because of affirmative action, even though they had higher educational attainment or more experience than some of their white colleagues that were teaching. For example, one of the faculty members that was in what we call the basic and transitional studies division now, she had a master's degree, right, to get hired. She needed that, she's a black woman, but her colleague, 
And she had years and years of experience doing the very work that was being asked of her in one of the most uh, underserved uh, 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 cities in America, Detroit. However, and she was recruited by a woman of color to come teach. However, she often was in conflict with her colleagues in that division who were mostly not people of color and particularly around her hiring and why she was hired. And she was also pitted against white men who didn't have as much mm-hmm. educational attainment or teaching experience as she has. And for, for her, she, 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 she put in her time here, she retired from here, but it devastated her. It almost killed her. And that was the reason why she left the college is because of health reasons from the stress, um, which goes us into the third um, theme that, that uh, jumped up was really uh, pronounced was battle fatigue the biases, the implicit biases, the microaggressions, the, di- the diversity initiative backlashes, which was I-200, was a backlash against all the different diversity initiatives that have been put in place to diversify the colleges, right? Student impact was, was really important to uh, black and brown faculty. And here we are today, part of our strategic plan under the leadership of Dr. Sheila Edwards Lang is to make sure that we hire more faculty staff of color because we know what the research says, right? Mm -hmm. That the folks that are in front of the classroom have a serious, serious impact on our retention and persistence and students do better when they're looking at folks that are being taught by folks that look like them, right? So this study gave faculty members, black identified faculty that had never, ever, ever been asked or ever shared. So the research here, these folks in this study never shared their experiences. And when they walked away and when they ended, when we ended this study, the one thing that they all said was thank you because they never were able to talk about what happened Mm -hmm. from 1998 until 2018 when we started sitting down and, and gathering the data. So this is another look at um, the analysis and the work of the analysis using critical race theory uh, as a, a, an analysis tool and the, the work that the Black Solidarity Think Tank is, is, is doing. This is, this is one of the reasons why we're doing the work that we're doing. It's partly because of Initiative 200 and the impact that it continues to still have on Seattle Central College. 